We've been talking about the code, and uh, I actually want to continue my series on the code. And last week, we recognized that codes are there for a reason. Sometimes they're a secret code. A lot of times, codes are used so that you can gain access. You, the, you got the code so that you can gain access. And we talked about, uh, last week, we talked about the first code, and the first code is faith. And that we need to have faith to be, ga- be, be able to access all that God has for us. In fact, the Bible says it's impossible to please God without faith. It's impossible to please God without faith, right? Because we need to believe that God exists and that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek after him. And so we know that the righteous person has to live by faith. Why? Because everything we do is by faith. We, we believe that when we pray, God's listening to us even though we don't see him. We, we believe that as we give our resources, God's kingdom will be expanded. We believe that if we live right and we know God and we, we've accepted Christ as our Lord and our Savior, if we put our full trust in Christ alone, that when we die, we're going to go to heaven. That's all by faith, right? And so the righteous need to live by faith. And Jesus so often actually commended people for their faith. In fact, he tells a woman, you have access my power through your faith. He said, you have accessed my anointing through your faith. So he always commended people for faith. On the other hand, the Bible says that he could not do any great miracles in his own hometown because of their lack of faith. And so doubt will close the door. Faith will open the door to the kingdom of God in our life. Now, I want to talk to you about another code. I want you to look in your Bibles at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20. Let's read it together. A large house contains not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some indeed are for honorable use, but others are for common use. So if anyone cleanses himself... Of what is unfit, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified, useful to the master, and prepared for every good work. And so today I want to talk to you about another code. It's called the honor code. And and I believe if there's something that is so deeply missing in our society today, it is the code of honor. If there's one thing that's missing in families today, in marriages, it's honor. If there's one thing that's missing even in the church today, it's honor. If there's one thing that's missing amongst men, it's honor. And I believe that every one of us in this room, as we understand the Bible, we will understand that the Bible is a Bible, is a book of honor. In fact, God is a God of honor. If you notice right from Genesis all the way to Revelation that God is a God of honor. In fact, the gospel is, is, is really founded upon the honor of God. I'm going to explain that in a few moments. You see, the truth of the matter is most of us really don't understand what honor really means. When we think about honor, we think about submission. And, and in some ways, yes, if we honor somebody, we will submit to them in the right way, right? That the Bible talks about that in Ephesians chapter 5, that Paul tells us that we are to honor one another, we're to submit to one another, which is, which is a part of honoring someone. You know, when we think about honoring, we think about respecting somebody. You know, we think about honoring a person, honoring a person for what they've accomplished in their life, or honoring a person for who they are. But, you know, Peter tells us that we're to honor everyone. So if we really understand the true definition of honor, we'll understand that honor actually is the foundation, the basis of every great society. And when we truly begin to understand and practice true biblical honor, it changes our life. When we practice true biblical honor, it changes our relationships. It changes our marriages. It changes our family. And in so many ways, it changes our society. I believe the number one reason for the breakdown of our society today is the lack of honor that we have for all human beings. Listen to me. 
Honor is the foundation by, by which every other virtue actually stands upon. Why? Because honor actually defined is esteeming someone at its highest level. It means to add weight to. It means to honor or recognize the worth and the value of another human being or another person. Listen to me. Honor is the act of placing great worth upon a person and upon an, a, a person in such a way that we would act as if they are valued. And as a result of them being valued, we treat that person with utmost respect and dignity. And it's always displayed in acts of love, in acts of grace, many times with acts of great compassion, with loyalty, with faithfulness, and with integrity. So to honor someone is to say, because I honor you, I treat you with dignity. Because I honor you, I treat you with reverence. Because I honor you, I treat you with respect. And my friend, the entire Bible is based on the fact that all men are created equal in the image of God. It doesn't matter what color they are. It doesn't matter where they've come from. It doesn't matter what language they speak. It doesn't even matter what they've done. It doesn't matter what predicament they find themselves in right now. Every human being is created in the very image of God. Can you imagine if we embraced honor in this society again? We would never abort a child because we would recognize that that child is honored by God, is created by God. We would never hurt another person. You can, can you imagine how our world would be transformed Form. There would be no more wars. There would be no more slavery. There would be no more bias. There would be no more uh, prejudices. Why? Because we would look at every single human being and we would say they are created in the very image of God. Therefore, because I honor God, I honor them. Come on. Help me out, somebody today. Help me out. Am I preaching it today? Hello. Therefore, all men are to be honored. That's why Peter says, honor everyone. So, so the truth is, could you imagine for a moment if we would begin to embrace honor as men, if we would embrace honor as men of God? You see, I know that it seems like a fantasy, but the truth is God created everything with a beautiful balance of honor because God is a God of honor. The gospel, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What he said was is I honor people to such an extreme, I love them so much that I'm willing to come down from heaven and die on a cross as a criminal because I honor people. I mean, that should blow your mind that the God of the universe, the God who created all things, honors you so much and loves you so much. See, honor is translated into love. Honor is translated into sacrifice. Honor is translated into respect, dignity, and so God wants us, though, to be vessels of honor. You know, Paul the Apostle says, in, in a great house, there are vessels, there are instruments of honor and dishonor. He said, some in the house are vessels of gold and silver. He said, but then there are other vessels. Those vessels are vessels of dishonor, they call them. And so in a great house, now he's not just talking about a simple house. He's not talking about a poor house. He's talking about a great house, a large house. He's talking about a wealthy house. I believe he's actually talking about the kingdom of God. He's talking about his house. And now I'm not talking about this building. I'm talking about his church. So he says in his church, there are vessels of honor and there are vessels of dishonor. 
Now, I heard somebody say that God is a sovereign God, and so that God sovereignly makes on vessels that are honorable and dishonorable. And I understand it. I get it. I see it in the scripture where the Bible says that the potter, he has the right to make whatever kind of clay into whatever he wants to make it. Now, I understand through the course of scripture from Genesis all the way to Revelation, if I look at the character of God, if I look at the nature of God, I believe that God sometimes uses certain things to make a, an illustration for us to understand a principle. But when that principle is taken way too far, Far, then all of a sudden it gets into an extreme where thou, now we believe that God makes people to go to hell. He created him for one reason, for them to go to hell. I can't embrace that, and the reason why I can't embrace that is because it would go against the very nature and character of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So what am I getting at? Because I know that there's some theologians in the room, and they're going to say to me, hey, but, but God made some vessels for honor and dishonor. But I want you to notice what Paul says. Paul says that if you cleanse yourself from that which is unfit and unholy, then you can become a vessel of honor. And so I believe with all my heart that even those that are living like a garbage can, even those that are living a life that's wasting away, even those that are bound, even those that are living totally counter what God wants for their life. God can take that person and God can redeem that person. God can save that person. God can heal that person. God can deliver that person. God can save that person. God can set that person free and God can change that person from a garbage can to a, to a person of honor. Hallelujah. You know, I love Teen Challenge. One of the reasons why I love Teen Challenge so much is because I see young men and women who come in and they're living a life like a garbage can. Garbage in, garbage out. They're putting garbage in their veins. They're putting garbage in their body. They're putting garbage in their lives, and they're living like a garbage can. Everything that comes out of them is garbage. And you might say, well, does that mean that, they're not, they're, that they are garbage? No, it just means they're living like a garbage can. But man, oh man, you see when God comes into that human being, and I've seen it over and over and over again. That's why I support Teen Challenge. That's why I go to Jamaica all the time, and, and I do a graduation for these young men. They come in, and their lives are a mess. But man, one year of just seeking God and letting God do that work inside of them and letting the Holy Spirit coming to their life and man all of a sudden God begins to change their whole entire life and man they become vessels of honor you know my, my friend Anthony Richards who's the director of Teen Challenge in Jamaica man he he was a drug addict he was living on the street he was eating out of garbage cans his life was a mess he went into Teen Challenge he gave his life to Jesus Jesus cleaned them up and today he's the director of Teen Challenge he's not a garbage can he's a vessel of honor come on somebody that's what my God can do. He takes the broken. He takes the outcast. He takes the weak. He takes the poor in spirit, and he turns them into vessels of honor. So God wants us to be a vessel of honor. So he says, in a great house, there are vessels, common vessels. And what was he talking about? Back then, when somebody was having dinner, they throw their scraps in this little bucket. It was a garbage can, you know? Now, here's an interesting, about, interesting thing about garbage cans today. The truth of the matter is we have really nice garbage cans. Do you ever notice? I have, a, I have a cool garbage can. My wife came home with a garbage can one time, and I was like, dude, this is an incredible garbage can. I, I just go like this, and I wave my hand over, and it opens up. <laughs> and it's silver. It's polished silver. It looks so nice. But, dude... The truth of the matter is, is, I don't care how nice it is, I don't care that I can wave my hand over it and it pops up, it's still a garbage can. That's all it is. It's, it's, it's a garbage can. You put garbage in it, and then you get rid of the garbage. And so I don't take the garbage can and, and put it on my table and say, hey, let's eat out of this vessel. You wouldn't come back to my house, right? So I make sure that I, I have a vessel, something beautiful. Now, now I, I'm using this just as an illustration. You know, every uh, once a month, we take communion on Sunday morning, and right? And we take communion out of a vessel, right? And that vessel is representation or rep re representative of the fact that there's, there, is, um, there is juice in there representing the wine, representing the blood of Christ and the body of Christ. And we think to ourselves how holy that is that we take something like this, a container, 
and we put something in it. Now, that's, that's just juice. It's not the blood of Jesus. It doesn't turn into the blood of Jesus. It's not the body of Jesus. It doesn't turn into the body of Jesus. It's a symbol. It's a symbol of what we have embraced in our life, that we have embraced the death and the resurrection and, and, and of Jesus in our life. And therefore, you know, we are, we are in awe. And as we hold that container in our hand, we think to ourselves, wow, Jesus died for us, right? You know, and it's a vessel. And so when Paul's talking about a vessel of honor, he's talking about getting the, the most beautiful vessel that you can get when you have company, when you have somebody special come over and you put the most, the, the best wine that you can find. Now, I'm not a drinker, and I can go into a whole thing about why Christians shouldn't drink, but just for an illustration today, you get your best wine, and you make sure that you, 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 you have that beautiful vessel to present that. Well, here's what God says to all of us in this room, and particularly men today. God's saying, I want you to become a vessel of honor. When I think about a vessel, it's just a container. But what he's really saying is, is I, I want your whole life to be a life of honor so that when you're poured out, what will come out of you is honor. <laughs> when you're squeezed, what will come out of you is honor. When you get cut off on the highway, what comes out of you is honor. When you go home and your kids are really, you know, really giving you a hard time, what comes out of you is honor. When your marriage is being squeezed, honor comes out of you. When you go to work and, 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 and your boss is getting on your nerves or you're tempted to do something that you know isn't right, instead of doing the wrong thing, what comes out of you is honor because you're a vessel of honor. So everything that flows out of your life is about honor. It's about honoring God. It's about honoring your family. It's about honoring your church. It's about honoring your community. It's about honoring other people. Why? Because your whole life is a life of honor. And honor starts in the heart. As the Bible says, as, the, as you believe in your heart, as you know in your heart, as the, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so God, Men want you to be a container of honor. Paul uses this illustration so that he can say everything in your life needs to be on the foundation of honor. I want your whole life, Paul is saying, I want your whole entire life, whatever you do, everything you do, do it all for the glory of God. I want it, your whole life to honor God. I want you to honor God with everything that you have within you. I want you to honor everyone around you. I want your whole life to be characterized by the power of honor in your life. Why? Because I am a God of honor. And when your entire life flows with honor, what really is happening is you're really honoring me. Why? Because honor is the foundation of your relationship with God. If God is a God of honor, then honor is the foundation of your life with him. And, and, and God said, when you honor me, I in turn will honor you. Notice what Paul tells us. He says, so if everyone cleanses themselves from that which is unfit, they will then be a vessel of honor, set apart, sanctified, useful for the master, and prepared for every good work. In other words, I want you to know today, men, wherever you've been, whatever you've done. I know some of you struggle with this concept so much. Because, man, you're struggling in your life. Or maybe you did things in your past, and, and the guilt of what happened in your past just strangles out the life of God from you because you feel so guilty. But I want you to know that God is saying to you today that if you submit yourself to him, you surrender to him, he will set you apart. The word sanctified means to be set apart. It means that God will clean you up. And he'll take that which seems to be a garbage can and turn it into a vessel of honor. Whoever you are, wherever you are today, I want to encourage you, Dad. I want to encourage you, man of God, that God can take your life. I, I'm just blown away. I, I'm absolutely blown away. I'm not perfect. God knows the things that I struggle with in my life. But, but I have to tell you something. I'm absolutely blown away a couple of weeks ago when, when we had Hope Day and we were able to serve 24,000 people. And I think to myself, God, I'll never forget being in, in my office and God giving me a word. I, Stephen, I, I, I want you to start this thing called Hope Day. And Stephen, I'm going to give you 30 sites. You're going to have 30. I remember the day that God spoke to me and said, I want you to, I want you to 
begin to partner with churches and organizations, and I want you to start this organization called Hope Day. And here I am a couple of weeks ago throwing the first ball out at a Met game, and I'm thinking to myself, oh, God, I was 19 years old. I was a mess. I was a garbage can. My life was about, you know, just living in the garbage heaps and just doing things that were wrong. And God, you took me, Lord God, from that to here, Lord. And, and it's not because of me. It's all because of your grace in my life. And this Tuesday, I went to pray to open up the Senate in Albany. And I'm thinking to myself, I, I clean up pretty good. I put a suit on. And I prayed in front of all these senators. And I prayed God bless them. And, and, and people were, you know, saying, I'm so proud of you. And, and some people say, you're a mighty man of God. I said, no, 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 I'm not a mighty man of God. I'm a man with a mighty God. That's it. Period. <laughs> Period. I'm a man with a mighty God. And I'll, and I'll tell you why. And I'll tell you why. Because I know who I am. I know where I've been. I know what I've done. I know that at 19 years old, I was a confused kid. I was lost. And I couldn't stop doing the things that I, I was doing. But, but I came to God. And I said, God, I want to be a man of honor. God, I want to honor you with my whole life. God, I want to honor you in my marriage. I want to honor you as a father. I want to honor you as a pastor. I want to honor you as a man of God. And God took this vessel, this common vessel, and he put his Holy Spirit inside of me. And whatever I do, it's all in demonstration of the grace of God in our life. That God, he gives us what we need when we need it, even though we don't deserve it. And he uses the foolish and common things of this world to confound the wise. The people that don't seem to be the most, the greatest candidates of his, of his power. God, he puts his power inside of us. And so I don't know what you've done in your life. I don't know where you've been. But today, dad, maybe there's some things that you're really ashamed of. Today, God, he wants to speak love in your life. You see, there are many voices that are going to be speaking to you. I'm going to talk about that one day. I'm going to do a sermon called The Voice and the voices that speak to us. But I want you to know today, real quick, the voice of God is reasonable, the voice of God is reassuring, and the voice of God is empowering. Amen. And if you're hearing another voice tell you that you're a garbage can and you can't be anything but a garbage can, then it's not the voice of the Heavenly Father. It's not the voice of your Father, because your Father says that he can take a garbage can and he can turn it into a vessel of glory and honor for his glory and for his name. <laughs> And that God can take your past and he can take your mess and he can take all the things that you've done in your life and he can redeem it for his glory and for his honor. But you have to decide. You've got to decide today. Men of God, you and only you can decide. Do you want to be a garbage can or do you want to be a vessel of honor? Do you want to continue to put garbage in your life? Because garbage in, garbage out. Do you want to continue to live like a garbage can? Or do you want to live like a child of the living king, like a more, more than a conqueror, like a, like a soldier of the cross, like a vessel of honor and glory for his kingdom? I love what God says in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 30. He said, I will honor those who honor me, but I will despise those who think lightly of me. Remember, you know, the truth of the matter is that the, the definition of honor is to give weight to something, to give weight to something. So when Paul was talking about being a vessel of honor, when we, when we look at honor in the scripture, what they were actually talking about was weights. And when they would weigh a coin, they would weigh it to assess its worth. And so the heavier the coin, the more it was worth. And so what, what God is saying here is when you treat my word lightly, when you treat me lightly, I can't respect you. But when you honor my word, when you honor my will, when you honor me and you treat me as the most important thing in your life, the heaviest thing in your life, I will honor you. And so that's what honor really means. It means that we, 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 we treat God with absolute reverence and holiness and understand. The word honor in the Old Testament is, is kabad which means to be heavy, substantial, or weighty. In the New Testament, it's translated. Listen to me. Here's the word in the Greek, doxa, doxer. And the word doxa means glory. 
And so the Bible says in everything that we do, look at me, listen to me, in everything we do, we do it all. Whether we eat or drink, we do it all to the doxa, the glory of God. And the word doxa can be also translated. We do it all for the honor of God. The Bible says that God is worthy to be honored. And so how do we honor God? Proverbs 3, 9 says, honor God with everything you own. Give him the first and the best. So, so men of God today, you might be here and you say, you know what, I want to be that, I want to be that vessel of honor. When I'm poured out, when I'm pressed, when I'm squeezed, when I'm challenged, every part of my life, every part of who I am, when I'm poured out, honor comes out of me. Honor comes out of me. Not dishonor, but honor. He said, how do we become a, a person of honor? Well, Proverbs 3 tells us the first way that we become a, a person of honor, look at me, men, is we give God our first and we give God our best. We give our first and we give our best. The writer of Proverbs says that we are to honor God with the first fruits of everything that comes in. You see, so when, it, when we talk about our giving, you know, the Bible says where our treasure is, that's where our heart is. And so I'll tell you what, men, you show me how you spend your money, and I'll tell you whether, you're not, whether or not you honor God. You know, the Bible tells us that when we honor the poor, we're honoring God. And so when we give to the poor, we're honoring our maker, right? When we give to the work of the kingdom, we're honoring God. We're honoring his kingdom. You know, somebody said, well, you know what? Uh, tithing, giving a tenth of all of our increase, our first fruit, is an Old Testament prophet, pra practice. You won't find it in the New Testament. You know why you won't find it in the New Testament? And you do find it in the New Testament, but there's not as many references in the New Testament as Old Testament. But you know why there's not so many? Because in the Old Testament, God said, give me the first fruit, give me 10%. In the New Testament, he said, give me everything. So keep your mouth shut and don't argue with God, just give him 10. <laughs> but you see, when we really honor God, God gets our first. And God gets our best. And so, men, let me ask you a question. Are you giving God your first? And are you giving God your best? Because that's what God deserves. He deserves our first. And he deserves our best. The first of our time. The first tenth of our treasure. The first of our heart. Does God have our heart? Because that's the key, honestly. The Bible says that we're to love God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind. And so when God has our first, he has our heart, then we recognize that every decision we make in life, God comes first. So how do we honor God? Whether we're a man or a woman, a young person, a teen or a child, how do we honor God? We say, God, you get our first, Lord, and you get my best. And so when I'm making a decision, I'm making a decision based on God being first in my life. And so my emotions are not first in my life. God is first in my life. My desires are not first in my life. God's first in my life. My body is not first in my life. God's first in my life. So you, you see how simple your life would become if you decide that you're going to honor God with your first and your best. You're going to honor God with everything. Every decision you make then is, does this decision lead me closer to God? Does this decision make God first in my life? Or does this decision really reflect that he's second in my life? It, it, it has to do with everything. It has to do with our money. It has to do with our relationships. Young lady, you might say, you know what? Um, I, I, I love this man. He's not a Christian. He doesn't love the Lord. He doesn't put God first. But I love him, and I'm going to marry him. Well, listen, here's the bottom line. If you ask God, God's going to say this one thing to you. Do I come first? Because if I come first, then your decision will be based on what God's word said already about relationships. See, it's real easy. I keep it really simple. I'm not a really, really, really intelligent person. All I do is I go, okay, when I make this decision, is this putting God first? Am I putting God first in my marriage? Am I putting God first in my family? Am I putting God first in my life? Am I putting God first in my finances? Does God come first? And if, if God is coming first, then I'm glorifying God. Number two, we honor God with our worship. Now, I know that most of us think worship means that we come in, 
you know, 10 minutes late on a Sunday morning because we don't want to stand for 20 minutes and we sing a couple of songs and then if we sing a couple of songs, Pastor Steve preaches and after he preaches, we come to the altar and worship is that singing part of our life. Listen to me, you could be singing all you want and not be worshiping the Lord because worship is not about singing. Worship is about putting God first, giving God everything. That's why Paul the Apostle said in Romans chapter 12 that we are to offer to him even our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God which is our reasonable act of worship. So men, we worship God every single day of our life as we first give ourselves to God and then we give everything that we are, everything that we own, everything that we hope for, it all goes to God. That's our act of worship as we worship God. So tomorrow when you get up, you're, you have the opportunity to worship God at work. Can you imagine if you began to realize that you know, your work can become an act of worship to God. Can you imagine that if you got up tomorrow morning and you said, you know what, I'm going to honor God at my work. First of all, you're going to have to pick your boss off, up off the floor and give him some oxygen because he won't believe the, the change that happened in your life. Can you imagine if you said you're going to honor God with your time? Everything you do, you're going to be honorable with your time. Wow. You would not only change your own life, you'd change everybody around you because they'd see such a different person in all of us when we recognize everything we do becomes an act of worship to God. So whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, we do it all to the doxa, to the honor and glory of God. We honor God with our obedience. One of the greatest ways that we can honor God is to obey God. Jesus said, if you love me, if you honor me, then you're just going to simply obey us. So, so practical obedience to God's word honors God. We honor God with our body. This is a really important one. In fact, listen to what it says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Do you not know that your bodies, your bodies as a Christian, as a believer, is the temple, the tabernacle of the Holy Spirit? Right? So here, here we are again. Vessels, temples, right? So when we accept Christ into our life, when Jesus comes to live inside of us, we're born again by the Spirit. And as a result of being born again, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us. And we become the vessel of the Holy Spirit. You talk about honor and glory and power and might and dunamis, power living inside of us. So he says, if you're going to honor God, you've got you to begin to see your body in a different way. That your body doesn't belong to you. Your body now belongs to God. The Bible says your body belongs to God because you're bought with a price, right? So now my life belongs to God, my will belongs to God, my money belongs to God, and I honor God with all of those things, right? My decisions belong to God, but my body, my actual body belongs to God. And in the context of what Paul is talking about, he's actually talking about sexual immorality, he's talking about adultery, he's talking about using your body. You know, if your body says do it, just do it. You know, if it feels good, just do it. And Paul the Apostle says, no, 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 no. No, game over. We don't do it that way. We don't live that, like that anymore. We honor God with our body. We honor our marriage with our body. We honor the relationships we have. We treat our body in the right way because our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And, and I'm not just talking about sexual immorality right now. I'm just talking about the body. As we look at our body, how do we treat our body? Do we eat the right foods? Do we exercise? Why? Because we get one body. And can you imagine if we would all realize that God gave us such a precious gift in our body? That God's given us this gift of a body. And if we take care of the body, God will honor our body. And we'll have a fruitful life. You know, I want you to know that a couple of years ago, man, I was not healthy. I was skinny, but I wasn't healthy. Now I'm skinny, but I'm healthy. <laughs> You know, and man, my body was breaking down. I had pains in my body. My cholesterol was high. I wasn't sleeping good, right? You know, my, my stress level was up. I wasn't taking the Sabbath like I should, and I'm still working on that one, you know, because my brother, my, my brother Scott calls me up, how was your Sabbath today? So I can't lie. That's one I'm still working on. Uh, but the truth of the matter is I had to start taking care of my body. Why? Because I honor God with this body. So if I'm injecting cholesterol in my veins, how do you inject cholesterol in your veins? Go out and get a big hamburger, right, from McDonald's. You know, and I'm, and I'm, not, and I'm not eating the right foods and I'm not taking care of myself. I'm actually dishonoring 
God because I'm dishonoring the thing that he gave me, my body. And so I decided a long time ago that I'm going to start taking care of my body. Why? Because I want to be like Caleb. I want to be 90 years old, and I want to say we could still take that hill. I don't want to be sick. I don't want to be all uh, miserable physically so that I can't do the work of God. Friend, here's what I'm believing. I'm believing that I'm going to preach until I'm 90 years old. And on Easter Sunday, I'm going to preach my last sermon. I'm going to sit down. I'm not going to be sick. I'm not going to have all kinds of disease in my body. I'm going to sit down, and God's going to take me home. Hallelujah. Praise God. I'm going to do my part. I'm going to do my part. I'm going to make sure I'm eating the right things. I'm going to make sure that I'm I'm balancing out my life. I'm going to make sure that I'm exercising. I'm going to make sure that I'm not putting junk in my body. I'm going to make sure I'm not putting drugs in my body. I'm going to make sure that I'm not putting alcohol in my body. I want my body to be pure. I want it to be lean. I want it to be mean. I want it to look good. And I want it to operate the way my spirit tells it to operate. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Because I want to glorify God with my money. I want to glorify God with my mind. I want to glorify God with my heart. I want to glorify God with my body. I want to glorify God with everything. Why? Because God is everything in my life. He comes first and he owns everything. Come on, somebody. I want to be a person of honor. I honor God by honoring my family. And lastly, as the worship team comes, I honor God. I think one of the greatest ways that I can honor God Listen to me, look at me. This is intense. One of the greatest ways that I can honor God is by trusting him no matter what. I honor God by trusting him no matter what. Paul said it this way, by life or by death, I'm going to honor God. In the good times and in the bad times, I'm going to honor God. In the times that I can't understand why God allows certain things, I'm going to honor God. In the times when I'm going through the fire like the three Hebrew boys, I'm going to honor God. When God tells me to go, I'm going to go. I'm going to trust him. I'm not going to ask a lot of questions. I'm just going to trust him with everything. Completely trusting in his sovereignty, in his will, in his wisdom in my life. You know, one of the reasons why God honored Abraham, Abraham. Abraham was a pagan. He was an idol worshiper. But then the voice of God spoke to Abraham, a pagan idol worshiper, and said, Abraham, I want you to leave everything that you have and come now and follow my command. And Abraham listened. And the Bible says, because Abraham obeyed, God honored Abraham and changed his name from Abram to Abraham, the father of of honor, the father of many nations. Why? Because he just simply trusted God. And one of the greatest ways that you can trust God is to say, I don't know why God took my son, my daughter. I don't know why God allowed certain things to happen in my life. I don't know why I'm in this situation, but I trust in his wisdom and his sovereignty. And I will honor him with everything I have within me, no matter what happens in my life. And when we begin to do that, that's the greatest act of honor is to say, God, I don't understand, but I still trust you. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, my mother's key verse when when I lost my dad, when I lost my stepdad. When a lot of difficult things happened in our lives, my mother used to always say, trust God with all your heart. And never lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge. You know what that word acknowledge means? Honor. Honor him, and he'll make your path straight. And so, men of God, God's calling you not to be a garbage can, not to put garbage in so garbage will come out. He's calling you to be a vessel of honor where what comes out of your life is honor honoring your God honoring your family honoring your marriage honoring your church honoring your community so that everything that comes out of you is honor and when you begin to honor 
your whole world begins to change. So men, today I have a gift for you. And I want to give you this gift and pray over you today. And so if, if you're a father today, I want you to stand to your feet today. I want you to stand to your feet if you're a father today. Let's give our fathers a big hand today. No more garbage cans. No more garbage cans. And for a few moments, folks, would you just, for, for just a few moments, would you allow me to just love on the dads for a few moments? Dads, you are so important. You're the key. That's why I'm telling you, you need to go to, you need to go to MDM. You need to go to boot camp. I'm telling you, you need to be trained. But you are the key. And God's calling you to live the code of honor in your life. And you can't do it on your own. It's something that you got to allow God to do inside of you. And the deeper the death you die to yourself, the greater res resurrection power will live inside of you. And as you surrender to the Holy Spirit, he's going to make you a person of honor. And so I want everybody in this place, we're going to pray for the dads in this room today. We're going to pray for them. And here's what I want you to do, dad. If you're a dad here, I want you to get out of your seat and make a line right here. I want to pray for you. Come on, quickly, make a line right here. And I have a gift that I want to give you. So make a line. If you're in the balcony, come out. If you're in the cafe, if you're in the cafe, just get up. And there's, a, there's somebody, there's a leader downstairs, and they're going to give you a gift, and we're going to pray for you in the cafe. If you're watching via live stream today, stand up wherever you are. Stand up right now. And if you, if you send us a little email, we'll give you a gift. We'll send it to you in the mail. You give us a 1,000? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. If you're a dad... All right, how many of you really love our dads? Come on, come on. How many of you love your dads? Come on, we love our dads. So we're going to pray. We're going to pray for our dads right now. But before we do that, you're going to get one of these dog tags. Now, I know that you're probably not going to wear this to work, you know, or wear it to a wedding. You know? <laughs> I spent a lot of money on these, you know. But I'm sure you're not going to wear these on a really nice occasion. So I just want you to take it maybe, you know, today I want you to put it on. I, I can't get it off now, but I, I want you to, you know, I want you to put it on today. What a mess I'm making out of this thing. Uh, today, just for a moment, I want you to put it on. I want you to put it on. I want you to put honor, like you're putting honor on, like you're putting a garment on. I want you to put this on like you're going to put honor on. And then if you want, take it off and put it on your rearview mirror of your car so that when somebody cuts you off, honor will come out. You know, or put it in your, put it, put somewhere in your house so when your kids are getting on your nerves, it, you'll see this thing and remember honor comes out of you. Or maybe put it somewhere where you'll remember that when a young lady comes trying to, trying to tempt you because you're a more seasoned, handsome man, you remember the honor code that you made some promises to God. When somebody comes and tells you you should disrespect somebody in authority, when somebody begins to gossip about your leaders, whether they're governmental leaders or whether they're, they're church leaders, you will say, no, I made a code of honor that I don't gossip about anyone. I don't pull anybody down, but I live the, the code of honor. And so, gentlemen, we're going to give you one right now, and I want you to come and stand. I want you to pull in really tight right here, as tight as you can, we're going to say a prayer together. Come on. I want you to take it out and put it on. Take it out and put it on. I know some of you really need directions. You take it out, put it over your head. I want you to take it out and put it on. Come on, all over this place, come on. And pull in, pull in as tight as you can. 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 I don't know if we're gonna get all the men here. Pull around there, pull around here, pull around here. Come all the way around. Get one and come all the way around because we want to be... Come over here, guys. Pull them all around. African, African chief, get this thing in order here, buddy. Come on. Come on, pull in closer. Pull in closer. Come as close as you can. I don't even care. You can step on. I don't care. Just step, just step as close as you can because I want you all to be together. Come on, pull it in. Pull it in. Move, move over. Move over. Move over. Move over. Amen. Come on. Praise the Lord. Well, 
Men, that means we need a bigger church. Are you ready? Grab one of these things. Make sure everybody has one. All the men have one of these. Pull in as close as you can. Folks, you should be blessed to know that all these men come to church. Half of the church are men. You know, there's a lot of churches. There's a lot of churches. You can't find a man in the church. All the women come to church. But not here, not at Bethlehem Assembly of God. Scott, not at Bethlehem Assembly of God. We got men in our church. Come on, we got men in our church. We got men who come to hear the Word of God. We got men who support the church. We got men who transform their world one man at a time. All right, so I'm not, I'm not suggesting that you try harder. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that you try harder. I'm suggesting that you surrender more to the Lordship of Jesus and let Him do that work inside of you. Because you could try all you want, just one day at a time. You are Lord. You are first. You are Lord. You are first. You are Lord. You are first. Man, there's been so many times when I've been tempted and I just said, Lord, you're first. I think, okay, God, I'm not going to make that decision because you're first in my life. Hmm? And the Holy Spirit will give you the courage and the strength to do that which you cannot do on your own. Amen? So we're going to pray together. You ready, guys? Raise your hand together. We're going to pray a prayer. The code. The code. And don't pray this prayer unless you mean it because the Bible says be careful to utter a promise to God unless you're willing to, to keep it. So let me tell you what the code is. With your help, God, I will, don't say anything yet, I will follow the code to honor God, to honor my family, to honor my church, and to honor my community. Are you ready, men? If you could say that, then say it with me. God, thank you that you have given me everything I need to live a life of holiness and godliness through the power of your spirit. Lord, help me today to live the honor code, to honor God, to honor you first, to honor my family, to honor my church, to honor my community, one day at a time. And should I fail, a righteous man gets up every time. Forgive me, Lord. Cleanse me, Lord. Use me, Lord. Set me apart, Lord, for your glory and for your honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, give the Lord a clap offering. Now, how many know, how many know that this sermon, how many know today, men, stay right where you are. How many know that this sermon was not just for men today? How many of you women in this room want to live a life of honor? Come on, stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. All right, everybody else, men, I want you to turn around and extend your hand towards these folks right here. You're the men. You're the leaders. All right, are you ready, ladies? Are you ready? Raise your hand right now. I want you to pray with me. Lord Jesus, thank you that you love me and you've given me everything I need to live a life of honor. Lord, help me to live the honor code to honor you first, to honor my family second, to honor my church, to honor my community. In the name of Jesus, amen. Come on, everybody together, give the Lord a clap offering. Hey, folks, don't forget, God has a plan for your life, and it's big. Have a good day. God bless you. Love you guys.